And we're back, so so let's get into our discussion of Metalhead. The most seen episode, no, the most aired episode ever. The most ever played episode. So quickly starts off with in the middle of a fight between the turtles and the crane. We don't know why they're there, we just know that they are having some random fight with the Krang. And then there's Leo. Because the Krang stole Donatello's ice cream cone. How dare they? <sighs> yeah, then we see Donnie having a really hard time against these guys all of a sudden. Some of the things that uh, Raf says in this entire scene are completely uncalled. For example, the scene where Leo says uh, failure's not an option and Donatello, of course, being the obs- obsessive compulsive person he is, runs up and says, well, technically failure is an option. And Raph responds by saying, you know what else is an option? Slapping you! It's like, I don't need to hear this right now, Donnie, but wait a little aggressive. <laughs> Yeah, and then he calls um, Donnie a girl about five minutes later. Like, how? He, like, he did not just do that. It's just so weird, because he was fighting the crank just fine with the bull staff for who knows how many ep- Well, okay, we can count them at this point. Like, about three or so episodes, and now all of a sudden it, it like, doesn't even phase them. All of a sudden it breaks. Well, they had to make- they had to make it, I guess, relevant. But what does happen a lot is that Donnie's staff breaks often. Not just in this episode, but throughout the season. Um, it's broken less and less as the series progressed, but yes, uh, in the earlier episodes they had like a running gag where his staff would be broken every other episode. Yeah. Even, like, it, it would have been nice if it wasn't like, oh, all of a sudden we need Donnie's weapon to be really inefficient just so we can make this plot seem slightly plausible. But I do like the, um, at least the concept of Donnie kind of doubting his weapon because this Donnie seems to, I, like, I wouldn't be surprised if he was, like, first-handed this bow staff and he's like, is this it? I, I, I was kind of hoping for something more, something bigger here. Like those turtles and training dolls, it's possible those might be a variant, but kind of suggests something like we might get a origin tale about how they received their weapon. Yeah, that could be. And this is the first season where they actually did say, or the first series rather, where they said the weapon chooses you rather than you choosing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just the first, as yeah, as you said, this being the first time that the turtles have, like, there's more to their weapons than just them being all like, oh yeah, these are cool blades, I think I could, I think this could work really well, but no, there's actually this added component of the, kind of like of the weapon choosing use, which I guess is maybe more psychological. In any case, though, it was, it's just kind yeah. of, really, it's like, it's really interesting, at least to see in the present, because like, this is the first time we've seen any of the turtles dissatisfied with their weapon, and if it was going to be anybody, um, it's most likely to be... Donnie in this series because um, everyone, at least at this point in the show, everyone kind of like kind of like compared themselves to their brothers slightly. Donnie kind of thinking, um, especially in the turtles in the what was like those comics that you can find on the Nickelodeon website. But in any case, Donnie's kind of thinking, oh well, I'm not the fastest, I'm not the strongest, and then you kind of see that in this episode where he's like, well, my brothers, or at least I can see him thinking that my my brothers, they're more efficient with their weapons, and this bow staff is not helping me whatsoever. So I can, I, I really appreciated that this episode kind of went down that road. With that free comic book day comic, they, they had Raph end up with Donnie's staff, and he, his comment when Splinter said, what did we learn? He said, sticks are lousy weapons. Yeah, basically. Um, but yeah, let's see. Kind of getting, maybe getting back to the, to that specific moment. So, fortunately, Donnie's weapon isn't necessarily doing the job. Um, so he ends up bringing, um, the, one of the Krang suits home to experiment with it. He grabs one of the Krang droids, and the others are a little dubious, but they kind of sort of see, like, yeah, maybe there's some benefit to studying uh, Krang technology, but, or at least I believe Leo um, sees some benefit in that. Mikey, I don't think he really cares, because he's not going to understand it anyway, and Raph's reaction, of course, is like, I don't need to study it. All you need to do is just hit it till the pink thing falls out. Hmm, that's funny. Well, he even says that. He says, like, uh, I... 
Yeah, I remember. Uh, and, of course, while they're studying it, Donnie starts sort of getting creepy all over April. I mean, I like the Don O'Neill pairing, but Donnie was just straight up creepy in this episode. Especially later on when he's like, she doesn't know I'm staring. And then she's like, um, I can hear you. But anyway. <laughs> But Raph was equally a dick in this episode, too. The comment he makes to Spike while Splinter is giving Donnie that new bow staff, it was rather ballsy for him to say it while Splinter was in earshot. Uh, Raph is just known for being <laughs> really gutsy. Like, I have expected Splinter to actually say, uh, you would be wise to remember that it is not the weapon that matters, it is the warrior's integrity. I think that was just kind of like the big lesson for Donnie to realize because like during this entire episode he was kind of trying to use his ingenuity to kind of kind of like take him out of the battle while Splinter is trying to remind him actually no you uh it's you need to kind of fight and you need to improve your own technique and your own um, abilities to improve. It can't just be your weapon. Yes, he actually does say something along that lines to Donatello while he's eagerly packing up the crying droid to take it into his laboratory because he says, you must prevail and battle not your weapon. And but then Donnie doesn't quite hear that and it's like, oh, no, Splinter says, uh, don't, it's, combat is not a video game. And then Donnie's like, that's a great idea. I'll turn it into a video game. And we're like, no, Donnie, you're not acting like yourself. Yeah. Like, I could see Mikey pulling something like that instead of Donnie, but in any case, uh, go ahead. And also, I think uh, since the fact that Donnie is 15 years old, I think if Splinter actually was expecting that if Donatello had any offense to what uh, Raphael was saying, he was expecting Donatello to deal with it himself rather than having Daddy defend him. So you can kind of see why he didn't really jump to Donatello's defense at, at Raphael's remark. Um, it could have also been that no one really... I don't think even Donna, Donny um, paid uh, much attention to what Raph was saying. I think at some point the turtles just kind of tune Raph out. That he's going to make ass hat comments, and that's just one of the ways he shows he cares. <laughs> at least he's getting better at tact. Yeah. But that comes, like, later. Way later. Also, I think this is the uh, one episode that's really started pointing out that Donnie's a pacifist. I, we've seen evidence of that in previous series, but that's kind of, like, already been in the an established part of his personality. And this one, it's like more like, it feels more like something he's struggling with. Yeah, because his, like, let's face it, the, the rest of his brothers are pretty gung-ho and don't really, it's not really uh, a, a mad, or, ugh, I can talk. It's not exactly um, any issue with them, but for Donnie to kind of have this trait that's so unlike his brothers, it's just like no one else seems to demonstrate it as well, not even Splinter. Um, at least maybe not in Donnie's eyes. Splinter's pretty pacifistic too, like on TV tropes they had five different uh, forms of pacifism and the one that Splinter demonstrates is he will not fight uh, unless he's backed into a corner or is given a reason to fight. But Well, not to say that Splinter isn't a pacifist like whatsoever, like, I, I agree with you, he does demonstrate at least control at the, like, at the very least, unlike the Shredder. Um, but, uh, what, like, what, like, my point is that Donnie maybe doesn't necessarily see that in Splinter, because Splinter, or maybe just, it, it, it's not something he look, he's looking at when he thinks of Splinter, he kind of thinks of, how would you, like, Sensei, Master, though in this episode you actually, you kind of also see Splinter encouraging Donnie to kind of embrace that, or is that more in the comics? Hmm. I could sort of see Splinter trying to encourage Donnie to embrace that, because, you know, where he says mercy is a strength, not a weakness, he could also say pacifism is also a strength, not a weakness, because it enables you to see how to um, find ways to get out of a situation with the least amount of casualties, rather than Raph's approach where it's pretty much, oh, kill them all and uh, let the authority sort them out. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, this episode really um, was at least partially Donnie kind of like working out his pacifist um, approach and kind of 
Are you trying to use, like, harmonize that with his brother's techniques while also staying true to his own, his own fighting technique? Yeah, and while Metalhead, of course, is a suitable weapon for him to use it from a distance, it actually is also bad because he kind of uses the distance that the video games brings to, like, kind of say, like, this isn't real, it, so it doesn't affect me. Or that I'm in more control? To an extent, like, he kept commenting, like, that it will make him invincible and, and such, and really he wasn't uh, affected by killing all those Krang or anything, because he was distancing himself from the violence. He was just viewing it the way one would view a vi video game. Yeah, it's a Joining in the fact that in this version, Metalhead's just like a robot you control and everything, instead of being its own separate character that walks and stuff by himself. That was one of the weird things, the first thing I noticed. Yeah, in the original 87 series, Metalhead was created during an episode where the turtles were all sick with a BS illness that they said was called the turtle pox. Yeah. Which, it's clear they had the flu. They just came up with the the BS answer that it was turtle pox because it affected only mutants turtles. How would they even know that, really? Yeah, like, because the Ninja Turtles are the only mutant turtles in existence except for Slash. So why would they know it's a rare disease that affects only mutant turtles? Logistics. <laughs> but yeah, in, in video games and any other form, he was basically, you know, his own robot that could walk, talk, and do everything. And this is like the first time he's just, well, he's just basically a robot, like a toy. With your controller, you move around and everything, so it's, it was kind of weird they did that. Yeah, so anyway, Don, Donnie comes out with Metalhead, and he demonstrates how Metalhead works. And at first, Leo's a little skeptical. He says, uh, what does this have to do with ninjutsu? And Donnie responds by saying, it has everything to do with ninjutsu, because we adapt, and this is considered adaptability. And even Splinter was impressed by it, but still, he warned Donnie not to take it into battle because it should be used for test purposes. It is weird though. I wonder why he didn't want it to be taken out into battles. That's the whole point of it and it worked, so I don't know. Well, to test, to give it a test run. Because once he did take it into battle, we were like, oh, actually it's really noisy and really clumsy and like it's it's just kind of like like a step-by-step -step process. This is like a brand new weapon. Um, may not, you may not want to surprise yourself in combat with, with maybe a flaw that you didn't see coming. So better to kind of like give it a test run um, in like in a, in a combat scenario, but not actually bringing it to combat where the stakes are much higher. Yeah, but on the flip side, if Donnie didn't take it on patrol with him, they, his, he would have been penned down by Krang fire with his brothers. And so in a way, yes, um, doing that was a mistake, but in hindsight, it also um, helped save their lives. If only the Krang didn't get control of it, it would have worked out great. And while all this is going on, April finds out something, I guess, it was like the Krang were sighted someplace or something on some random YouTube video or something, so she went to investigate. Yeah, I, I almost forgot April had an important role in this episode. Yeah, she had, she had started a forum where people post all weird things around the city and in order to kind of secretly get information on what the Krang are doing and, and where her dad might be located. And this is probably like one of the first episodes where we see her actually taking an interest in her dad again after the season premiere. Oh god, that's right. The series had a big problem with that. And also we were wondering how she she got her intel as well, and now it's finally answered six episodes later. Or maybe I should say more like four, but anyhow, kind of took long enough for April to renew interest in her dad and his well-being. Also, I felt it was, I don't know, really impulsive, like really, really impulsive of her to kind of go scope things out without any sort of backup. I mean, in a way, it was a good thing that she did, otherwise she wouldn't have learned that the Krang were planning to poison the city's reservoir or something like that with the mutagen, but at the same time, it was kind of like, it was a little dangerous. Could have, there were so many ways where it could have gone wrong. Yeah, like she could have been caught by that Krang because she saw like that one looked at her and then it cocked its head like, who are you? And at that point, the, there was like the Krang didn't have any clue who she was or that she was important whatsoever. Well, I don't know because then they revealed air that the, fir the first, the reason they kidnapped her father in the first place 
was not so much to kidnap him, but to kidnap April. I guess he was just because, you know, he happened to be there, so they should have known. Well, they were kidnapping scientists to be sure, and we learn later that uh, the Krang were after her, and the possible clue for that was pro during Alien Agenda, where she sends in her saliva, and they probably realize she's the one they really want. Like, I th believe that was your theory, Don. Um, I was thinking that, like, it, it's a... Bleh, goodness. It seemed to me that it was ap after um, episode 15 where the Krang took his, like, took a specific interest in her. Like, at the time, watching episode 15, I was kind of like, um, so why did they show, why did they bother showing up at her school with, with this new robot? Are they after her specifically? And it turned out, yeah, it's her specifically, but no idea why. Yeah, and one plausible thing that makes sense is that she could be part Dimension X, which they would have learned through her saliva, and then... So April has alien spit. <laughs> At least her DNA, anyway. Partially, yes. <laughs> you have alien spit, April. So, anyways, April, like, escapes... And let me see. That was that was before training. Yeah, so she just escaped and stuff, and the turtle showed up. Mine is not a turtle because she's at home, and she tells them all about the plot and everything. So they got to go in there. And that's where we get the creepy scenes with Metalhead and April. Like, hey, do you like heavy metal or something like that? Or... That was such a corny joke. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I winced. I'm like, Donnie, you are better than that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the creeping staring and everything. The zooming yeah. in on her. Yeah. April rolls her eyes like, oh god. Like, Donnie, you are such a creep. <laughs> Fortunately, he matures after that. It's... Yeah. Through this monitor, she can't tell I'm staring. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm so you glad you that. that. I could hear that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, and then you, you know, know you I was joking. That. Hope she bought that. Yeah. yeah, anyway. And after that, we know for sure that April knows of Donnie's crush. But at that point, it, it seemed to mainly that she was blowing him off. Well, because he was coming off as a creep, um, which was really turning her off. And, and that should have been, like, uh, I'd say this should have been the actual episode four. I think, because we were commenting about uh, what the chronological order of the episode should have been. And chronologically, I would gather that uh, New Friend, Old Enemy should have uh, been episode three, and this one should have been episode four. Yeah, and then have kind of like Turtle Temper appear later, where it doesn't... Kind of like those random middle episodes where they, you know, filler. In any case. I don't know how Turtle got the picture of April in the first place for his, like, screensaver. He uh, probably took it without her knowing. Oh, oh yeah. He's sort of glancing in his direction or something. Yeah, but you know how people use act like they're te texting on their phones but are actually taking pictures? <laughs> that makes him sound even creepier. Well, Don't mind me, April. I'm, uh, just texting Mikey, who's right next to me, but I'm texting him anyway. Just keep, just keep eating that pizza. <laughs> click, 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 click. Oh, yeah. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> <laughs> Look at her eat that pizza. Yum, yum, yum. Okie doke. <laughs> of course, this this would not sound as bad if it was the 80s April and not the teenage April, but I would actually well have been funny if Don thought the 80s April was way hotter and our April, the 2012 April, would be like bothered or annoyed or jealous or something because that, that is a common thing. Girls in TV shows or whatever usually don't like the whatever whatever creepy guy but oh when a creepy guy checks out someone else then you start getting kind of jealous or upset or something well you remember like with Avatar um, Katara wasn't really interested in Aang all, all that much she would say like oh yeah he's m like a younger brother to me and whatnot and then when Aang was getting involved with that fan club on, on Kyoshi Island she was like downright jealous and I think we sort of hear a hint of jealousy in April's voice at in episode 20 when Donatello was like commenting about how it's too bad they couldn't trust Karai because it would have been good to have a, another Kunoichi on their side and April's like oh it's okay I get it she's our mortal enemy but hey she's pretty I don't think I even saw that episode either sorry Paige 
I said I don't even think I saw that episode either. I don't even remember now. Did I see it? Um, I don't remember. It's the one where where they try to attack Shredder in the docks. And that's why Karai got pissed at them because basically they betrayed her now, so... No, I don't think. We'll get- we'll probably get into that episode a little later then. Oh, yeah, at some point. Yeah, Hopefully some point. the DVDs come out soon for them, because Kai won't be able to discuss it at all. No, in the meantime. But then, meantime. afterwards, um, let me see. So Metalhead joins the action because the turtles are totally outgunned by the Krang, and... You know, Metalhead starts blasting everything. It looks good for the turtles, minus the friendly fire. And what Krang is like, I don't even know how they would recognize Well, I guess they would recognize it if you're not sick technology, but it's like, you know, that thing that's doing violence against Krang should do violence for Krang. So, like, he crawls off the robot. And that's an interesting scene that, seeing how the robot actually powers down and turns off and everything as the thing crawls out. And he crawls on top of Metalhead. I don't even know how the hell that works. He just face hugs it and bam, I can control it now. That's kind of... Probably had something to do with that weird, like, interface. Like, on top of Metalhead, there's, like, that... There's a particular Krang component that Donnie wasn't quite sure, like, how it worked. Oh, yeah, that's right. But either way, so if, it's like, if our TV doesn't want to turn on, we'll just put a Krang on it. It'll turn it on. First loses control of Metalhead because there were, like, some gas canisters that uh, apparently may have had mutagen in it, or... Well, certainly the mutagen was destroyed in that moment, and Metalhead gets caught in the blast, and uh, he loses the electronic signal. So Donnie's like all frantically looking around, trying to find a way to override it, and then he notices a crane climb on top of it, on top yeah, of Metalhead. Yeah, that was a disgusting so he... close we did not need to see. <laughs> Yeah, so um, Donnie warns his brothers, like, hey guys, you just might want to worry about that thing I or brought with you or something like that. And... and then, of course, comes the most stupidest part of the entire episode. Like, yes. it must have some kind of weakness! Yes, and they never consider hitting the ch huge wad of hu used chewing gum that serves as the nervous system of the entire robot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Exposes Crane. That's the entire problem. Right on the thing's head. I know, like, for censorship, they can't really, like, cut it or stab it, but at, at least kick the thing off it or knock it off it or I don't know. Just Yeah, I know, like, Mikey has nunchucks. There's a scene where Mike and Leo are just hacking and attacking the robot with no veil. I mean, it's right there. Kick the fucker off. But there's no reason, like, there must be some weak point, you know. It's like, oh my god, there's just no reason for that. And then Mikey gets the bright idea of doing a nut shot. Yeah, which of course did not go so well. He's lucky he still has toes after that. Yeah, and so while Donnie's frantically looking around for a way to override the controls to Metalhead, Splinter shows up and says, Donatello, the time for games is over, and... Donatello realizes, okay, yeah, my brothers need me, and Splinter tosses him his bow staff, which he looks at dubiously, but then accepts, and because that's a weapon he knows how to use, and he goes racing off to just in time to save his brothers from getting blasted. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> so he jumps in, um, and unlike his brothers, it kind of like reminds me um, of episode of Operation Breakout, where kind of like, oh, what would the brothers do without Donnie's ingenuity? But yeah, he ends up using his resourcefulness and ends up saving the day. Even though Metalhead being part of the problem, Donnie was technically the solution. But that sounds so cheesy. Yeah, and both Leo and Mike congratulate him for for winning and coming to his senses, and, and then Raph proceeds to rub it in his face. He's also the reason they were nearly killed. Yeah, that's true. Like, Raph yeah. just... I'm surprised Raph that they took him. Metalhead back after all that. I would imagine... Are you crazy? They turned that thing against us or something. I'm surprised that they allowed him to take it back. Because, of course, obviously they did since he appears in other episodes, but yeah. Well, if they left him there, the crane could have used him, maybe. No, well, that's true. Donnie probably felt like they could still use the Krang technology, just not as a weapon. And then, finally, um... Well, I think the episode 2, the water supply thing, was such a throwaway line, you know? They could've... I would've preferred him actually seeing the Krang 
preparing to start dumping immediately and that before the turtle showed up. I mean, it just seemed like just a random plot that, that should have been shown more instead of just one or two lines of dialogue. Yeah, like that could have been, a, like that was a real credible threat to the city, probably just as threatening as like the Technodrome kind of hovering above. So, I don't know, yeah, I kind of agree with you. It should have, I would have appreciated maybe if they were even like next to the reservoir and then the turtles show up, like, oh, yeah, geez, exactly. thoughts riding on this fight. And then kind of reminds everyone that, yeah, Donnie did save the day, so, I don't know. By the way, um, Don said, you haven't seen much of the 80s cartoon if much at all. Have you seen like what the Tetradrome looks like in the 80s cartoon? Not in the 80s, no. Because we were going to ask you like what you thought of how it looks like now as compared to then, but it wouldn't be a fair comparison if you haven't seen the 80s cartoon. Um, I do remember kind of like um, I do remember that Metalhead showed up in the 2003 cartoon. I'm not sure how he compares. To yeah, it was a different name, but so same general idea of Robot Turtle, but yeah. The Turtles also switched with weapons in that episode too with Donnie wielding rough size. The interesting thing about that one is that that robot was supposed to be like a made up character for the turtle video game at that time and like when you play the game they have cutscenes based on the cartoon episodes but then when you reach the part with Metalhead they have all these extra like made up redrawn cutscenes to reflect how there's like a robot framing the turtles and stuff like that before you decide let's put them in the cartoon anyway that's pretty interesting but yeah originally he was supposed to be just an exclusive toy and video game character before they actually put him in the 2003 show and i guess in a certain way he was also activated by baxter but i mean he still moved and thought by himself he didn't need someone at the controls, so to speak. Just turn them on and let them go, you know? So that was, that was still, and I, I guess because, wasn't it like half a crane they brought over or something? I guess maybe that's why Metalhead is so small, but it's weird seeing him that small. I always thought the future of ninjutsu would be taller. But I mean, it is true though. Ninjas do adapt and everything. They wouldn't still, I, I uh, assume that modern day ninjas would have been using all kinds of sniper weapons. They wouldn't still be reduce it just swords and things like that. So. I think they'll still go with the old classic swords and stuff more. I don't know. If they want to go by tradition and old ways, they'll use the old old weapons unless they want to do new technology. But I don't see a ninja with a sniper rifle. <laughs> well, yeah, but they're supposed to be stealth. But I still don't see a ninja with a sniper rifle. Yeah. Because unlike the movies and stuff, if you see a ninja fighting, he already failed because you're not even supposed to see him. You're supposed to just die without even knowing or what killed you. Like the Uncle Yo uh, joke where he says if a guy comes up to you and says hi I'm a ninja automatically bad ninja. And then of course there's the, the, the movie rule that if you fight like thousands of ninjas they all go down quickly. If you fight just one all oh, crap it's going to be like a real badass one. So he has like the turtles rock because it's just four of them. Those like a whole bunch of turtles they would have been all cannon father. The foot as they are now. Kind of like that. Yeah, that's the thing. I wish the foot were more of a threat. I do understand if they if they're useless later on, but in their in their first episode, it just still did a little something. You know, the foot soldier who tried to attract Bradford and his sword got stuck in the ground, and he's and he's like busy wasting time pulling. It's like, oh, dude, you can do better than that. Yeah, throw shuriken, throw your shoes, throw yourself. Don't just sit there trying to yeah, pull that your makes, that makes Bradford out. and Shredder look bad based on their quality of their students. Yeah. Execute that one, and uh, the other guys are sort of okay. So I guess um, at the end of the episode, everyone right, wants a valuable um, life lesson. Does anyone else have any other thoughts for a metalhead? Well, they do have like that fatherly ending or that conversation between uh, Donatello and Splinter at the end, because, you know, afterward, because I swear that had to have been the most awkward walk home ever. And of course, the missile firing bow staff. The rocket. Rocket, yeah. I mean, yeah, the only character aside from Donnie we see reacting to Raph's tirade is Mikey. We don't see Leo giving any um, comments or disapprovals or anything like that. I like how when the bow rocket goes off, Spencer's just there like nothing. The turtles are running away, but Spencer's just there. He probably he probably had Donnie pointed at a area of the lair that would do the least damage. I kind of think that... Like, if it was a cartoon with a fuse, Spencer would be like the kind to just stay there like nothing and lick his finger and just pull out the fuse at the last possible second, all super nice and calm, like nothing's going on. Splinter rarely loses face. Yeah. Yeah. So I um, guess, um, rate the episode. 
Um, what do you think about like the conversations Winter actually had with Donatello um, before the missile launching post staff was? I'm you know, trying revealed. to remember. Wasn't it the what basically um, something about how he saved the day and stopped the Krang and all that stuff with nothing but a stick? Yeah. yeah um, basically, he was there moping. Um, yeah, just kind of. He basically said. Yeah, Donnie was kind of like sitting around, just kind of like, oh man, I really messed up. And Shredder basically told him, well, yes, you're responsible, but responsible for all this good stuff, like saving the city and defeating the Krang with your ingenuity and a stick. And then Donnie's like, hey, yeah, you're right. And Splinter's like, yeah, I am. And the other three guys are playing a video game and completely ignoring Donnie until he tells them to run. Yeah, until then. And then Leo, like Leo and Raf just kind of getting a little squabble. But yeah, um, to kind of focus on the on your question, um, Venka. Um, yeah, I really, I, I, I really appreciated that moment. Cause it's just like um, we rarely see at that point. We had rarely seen Splinter be like a father, rather than just a sensei. So that was. Um, it was nice to kind of get that insight into, um, into Splinter comforting his sons rather than just kind of like sitting on the sidelines and letting them make their own mistakes, which I'm glad he does that. Um, I'm glad he kind of lets them grow and um, grow and learn, but it was kind of nice to see him get involved, or more involved, I should say. Paige, any thoughts? Pass? <laughs> About what? What's just like the final thoughts of the whole episode? Splinter's conversation with Donnie. Either or. Um, I really don't know what to say. It was, you know, like you said, it's a sweet father, a fatherly moment between um, Donnie and Splinter. Um, I don't really know what to say, honestly. Mark? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't have much thoughts. It's just, you know, lesson learned not to doubt himself. And, you know, that the weapon he chose isn't as bad as he thought it was because he could still, you know, use it efficiently. It's, you know, like the whole Iron Man thing, I guess, that it's not so much the weapon, it's the person who uses it and stuff like that. Like he said. <laughs> In the 2003 series, and they have like that one part where all the turtles were comparing their weapons and which one was better, and Leo said like, oh, I have the twin katana, so mine is the best weapon, and then Splinter comes out and says, uh, any weapon is deadly in the, hand, in the right hands, and uh, no one's weapon is better than anyone else's. I remember once in the 80s cartoon, Raphael threw a couch at Donatello. And Don's like, what the hell is that? And he's like, hey, any weapon's dangerous in the hands of a ninja. All right, um, getting to rating? Yes. So what would you guys rate this episode? Hmm, I think it's kind of um, similar to um, episode five in that it doesn't quite add too much in terms of plot. Or I shouldn't say plot, but in terms of, I guess, development of what the villains are up to. And it doesn't really change the status of the show entirely, so... I would, hmm, I actually think, though, that I would put it up as a four. Like, a, it's a good episode, um, but it, my only problem with, with it would have been that it didn't actually move um, the, any conflicts forward, except for, except for Donnie, of course. But, yeah, I think that's the highest I would give it. You guys? It's, I don't know, I mean, the episode wasn't that, that bad, but I think it was kind of burnt out because... Because it just rerun it on TV so much. That's that's the main thing. The episode itself wasn't that that bad because we've seen Don's staff break many times before. This is the first time that he actually addresses it and makes an entire episode about making like just plain getting a better weapon than, than his staff all the time. And I mean, I like Metalhead, and when I saw the in the, the store, it was like the first figure I bought of the second wave, so it was pretty cool that Metalhead was in the show already and everything, but I don't know, I mean, the episode wasn't that bad, it's just, it's, it's just, they show it so many times, I'm so sick of it by now, unfortunately, I mean, when we saw it on DVD, I mean, I was new line by line already, because they kept putting it, I don't know why, it was like the default episode, it's like, just put the episode to Shredder and stuff, oh man, we got another half hour to kill, what do we put, um, um, I can't think, oh, let's put the metal episode again, I'm sure they love it, you know, it's like, they keep putting it over and over, but, that's the only thing it has going against it, but I mean, you know, it has Don dealing with his staff, it has April going on her own and doing everything by herself, she didn't need anyone to save her, she actually got out of the situation by herself, and, you know, like I said, Metalhead's in it, so yay Metalhead, but other than that, you know, it's just, it's just like, not against the episode, because it's not the episode's fault that they decided to choose that one to air so many times, but that's the only thing they got a problem with, is they just 
run into the ground. What you completely rating? What you complete rating? I guess the whole. I don't know, because newcomers might like it. Maybe the one that's above the kick it out of bed fiends. The second one. What's the second one called? Good episode. Yeah, it was only good episodes. Just that's your number four rating. Yeah, number four rating. It's just it's just we're personally burnt out, but a newcomer might like it because it's got a robot turtle in it. And also, there's a decent amount of action. I mean, it starts off with action right in the beginning, so kids won't get bored. So you know. Um, I'm trying to think what to say. Um, Mark pretty much Mark pretty much said what I was just thinking that um it was a pretty good episode I guess but it just I really I did like it whenever I first watched it it was interesting had action had a little humor with um every single every single time Donnie would ask Splinter if he could do this he'll be like why would you say no I I it's unfair blah 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 and then obviously Splinter said yes a little cute well he he was expecting a no yeah kind of cute humor kind of thing but um they just played it too too much it's like we would be hoping it's an episode I haven't seen because of work and then Nope, Metalhead, and then next week, nope, Metalhead again, and then next week, oh, no, new episode, I mean, uh, another episode, and then uh, it was actually something else. I don't even know, but obviously, again, I watched the episode. I don't know what to rate it, I was going to say a three, um, number three, the middle rating. It'll be, it, I don't know, it's interesting, but. But you wouldn't recommend it to a I new guess, cover. yeah. I don't know. You wouldn't have to recommend it to a newcomer. It's probably be the first episode they watch on TV anyway. <laughs> if you're going to it so many times, I'll probably be the episode they'll see. And how about you, Vanga? I'm probably going to rate it a four because this was like one of my favorite episodes of the season. It's not my absolute favorite of, of the season. I don't think I have an absolute favorite of the season, but um, this was certainly my favorite episode thus far, and it, yes, it sort of addresses some issues with Donnie, but he at the end it kind of hints like he hasn't quite learned his lesson of the story, and it hasn't, he doesn't really gain any appreciation from his brothers, or like, oh yeah, thanks for saving our lives and all, but we still are not happy you tried to kill us or you, your invention tried to kill us. I think it's just um uh we get, when you also think about the episode episode four, new friend, old enemy. I mean Mikey's kinda of like sitting there in front of a computer screen and they're all celebrating and not really thinking about the fact that he's kind of down in the dumps too. So um the I think it's just mainly that the other turtles just kinda of like get in their own world and um either that or they yeah. They don't really, once they, they say their piece and then that's it. Um. Yeah, but Raph came and comforted um, Mikey because he was like, the one who was being particularly abrasive towards Mikey in that particular episode. And this one, none of them actually come to talk to them. It has to be Splinter who talks to Donatello about it. Well, when you really think about it, it was Splinter who was, like, most involved with uh, Donnie throughout the episode. Except for Raph, um, who did have... he Like, he always has his jabs towards the other turtles. Um, he always has, like, one particular focus uh, in each episode. But it, it kind of makes sense that Splinter was the one to comfort uh, Donnie instead of any of the other turtles because it was Splinter who was offering the advice in the first place. Whereas in episode 4, he didn't really, he wasn't really involved besides to say that Mikey learned a kata from the Shredder and that was about it. You know, one thing I noticed is that Splinter didn't have one of those father moments with Mikey yet. Yeah, that's true. He's had his serious talks with Leo and, you know, the whole, I guess, cheer me up thoughts with Mike and, I'm sorry, with, um, Don and um, Raph, but he's never had any whatever with um, with Mikey. Of course, Mikey is rarely, rarely sad, and the one time he was, it was Raphael who talked to him, but yeah, he didn't have any serious whatever alone time with Splinter, some kind of, I don't know, don't be sad, Mikey will buy you a new skateboard. I don't know. Oh, that's a good point. Well, fortunately, it sounds like Mike is going to mature a little bit in the next season, and I think the near-death experience and of one of their brothers and um, also Mikey's own near-death experience in the season finale did will attribute to that. But well, we'll have to see. Because one thing cartoons always seem to mess up on is when a character's known for being the funny one, they they tend to ignore much character development and maturity because they don't want to lose that funny, silly character. Which is one of the things people complain about the 2003 Mikey where he, like, learns lessons and forgets them by the next episode because, of course, he has to keep being the funny one. So we'll have to see. Well, 
Actually, this is Greg Sipes who actually said that Mikey will mature yeah, quite interesting a bit. To see. So, even though he is grabbing like random people's underwear in the, in the second season for whatever reason, yeah, that that really is one of those things where you just, I mean. I don't know. You just have to watch whatever episode that's in to find the context of that. That's just randomness for the damn sake of randomness. They don't wear clothes, so why would he have underpants? We will find out. <laughs> Until then, no clue. So, yeah, I would definitely rate um, Metalhead a 4 because it did have its problems. Donnie doesn't quite learn lo- his lesson. He so, And... While there are some problems that are kind of brought up, they aren't completely addressed, which hopefully they will as the season, well, we know they sort of do as the season progresses, and I, and hopefully they will be looked into more in the next season. But, like you said, Dons, they don't really gain anything, they, there isn't much development other than... They crang are doing something random, and the turtles have to go stop it. Formula, so a definite four. Right, I think that kind of closes us up. Yep. Any final thoughts for the uh, podcast before we close up? I don't up? know because uh, we recently played the TMNT of the Shadows game. I'm not sure if any of you guys have played it. Haven't. I've been watching a kind of like a walkthrough of it, and it like starts out with like kind of a. A dark screen moment where you hear the turtles fighting and they, um, Donatello yells, April, run! And then we're stuck on April's point of view and controlling her and until she gets kidnapped at the end. Ugh. I don't like the game. I don't know, it's just annoying. We can't even get past, um, chapter one. The main thing about the game, I don't know, it, it, it relies a lot on powering up your turtles and stuff, and I guess the more you play, the more you earn whatever that power up your turtles, but it's just just... annoying, because you shouldn't have to do that for the first level. I do understand for the second or third, but I mean, you should be able to at least pass the first level. The only thing is, I can't, like, the health, health-wise, it sucks. That's my only problem with the game, is more health-wise. Like health products, like health kits, med yeah. kits, pizza, you, and everything. You else. die, and you can choose to be here from the from the last checkpoint. But then you don't start the next checkpoint with full health. You, you're still like a hit or two away from dying. It's like, yeah, that um, that really helps. And you can have like one of the other turtles revive you, so long as you're playing one That's of the other turtles. I never knew that. <laughs> we just let the tur- other turtles on the ground, like look <laughs> dead, <laughs> unconscious. I mean, not dead. We just let them on the ground. <laughs> but when you revive them, are they full health, or do they, they just get revived with like one or two hits or something? I, I don't know. Because you probably get revived with just one hit or something. I think you revive with quite a bit of energy, I think. But, um, yeah, you have to like collect uh, sodas and pizza for health. They're really hidden. I would, I would find some med kits or whatever, pizza, whatever. But they're like real hidden. If you would, if you don't really pay attention, you're gonna miss it. And some of the conversations they have, like uh, I was like watching the walkthrough of chapter one, and you hear like Leonardo saying like, like seriously, they call these guys punks or something, and Raph says, "You call them punks," and and Leo's like, "What would you call them?" And and Raph's like, "Well, punks is a little dark for you, me." Punks. I don't know. After a while, the dialogue was just getting so annoying because they kept talking and talking and talking. Yeah, Mikey just went over like all his different kinds of pizza preferences like for almost like 20 minutes straight. It was really, especially whenever you're trying to figure out where to go next and then all you hear is them talking constantly. Saying something random like they do in the rock star things like, oh, that wasn't what it misses, uh, so-and-so's cats in the casserole was... I think I was just texting, shut up, I don't care. Yeah, and of course you also hear the random foot ninjas uh, talking, or or Splinter, well not Splinter, well Splinter will like give them advice, or but that's like a memory voice of Splinter, which seems kind of distracting. And of course uh, when they're fighting the Shredder, they... Shredder would say things like, Oh, you look like you are clowns in a clown car. Such, such. Or, What am I watching exactly? Scary banter right there. (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't know. Well, some, something else bugged me about the game. The camera, the No, no. The no, that's you. Ah, <laughs> oh, what the heck would that not like? That Oh, it's going to bug me now. I had it. Now I forgot what it was. Watch, I'll remember it after we finish the podcast. Um, there's areas where we don't know where to go sometimes. No, that... Parts that... No, no. The crane and like, And, like, they... Well, it obviously follows, like, the 2012 series, but it kind of gives it a, kind of, like, a grittier, almost IDW kind of feel well, to it. Well, the design-wise, uh, I don't like the design. It's too turtleistic. Real t- tur- real turtles instead of, like, the cartoony turtles. Like, the little banter where um, Mikey is asking uh, about getting a tat or... S- oh, yeah, I remember uh, that. Or something, and... Yeah, yeah and... Raphael's like, sure, and why doesn't Donnie come along? He could get a big heart that says April on it. And Donnie's like saying, like, I'm not listening to you, la, 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 la. Yeah, this, this oh, yeah, I remember what it was. What was it? Just that one cut scene for um, whatever the Krang is going to, that one Krang is going through the hallway. You can't skip it. You have to keep watching every single time you die. You have to keep watching every single time you have to replay the that checkpoint. They're gonna keep showing that stupid scene. I wish they had like a skip scene kind of thing. No. Oh yeah, you can't. Yeah, you can't skip any of the cutscenes. So that's kind of annoying after a while. Yeah, that's true. I still love the whole Mikey making fun of the Krang. But it's also stupid because they had so much details on the Krang that they do look like weird robotic guys. So it's like, yeah, not much of a disguise. I mean, anyone would know that's a weird robotic looking dude. But what were you gonna say, Mark? Um. Uh, oh, the turtles. Well, yeah, like you said, I mean, they're just designed different. I guess the major difference is, of course, April's an adult now instead of being her kitty self. But, but yeah, everything is it's kind of sort of like kind of sort of not, but kind of sort of at the same time, based on 2012, because they don't really have any themes or characters that are not in the 2012. I mean, the Krang are still there. They still talk like the Krang, and I mean, you still got Foot and Purple Dragons. They don't really have anything. That that is not in the 2012 cartoon, like you know, be up a rock steady or or stuff like that. So so yeah, it is kind of sort of like a gritty, more realistic version of 2012 cartoon. Like kind of yes, kind of no at the same time. But I didn't, so far I don't see any characters or enemies or anything that's completely out of the ordinary. That that something that that we have not seen in the 2012 cartoon, or than than the designs. You guys still there? Yeah. So yeah, but Verity, we gotta you know play the game a bit more, find out how to revive the turtles now that we found out, and um, power them up. Even though you shouldn't have to power them up just to get past the first damn level. But I'm not too excited to replay the game. I don't want to play it again. I know, but we still gotta you know give it a more fair review and see what's up. But <laughs> nah. yeah, it was a bit of a letdown for me though, because I was really looking forward to this all summer. It was advertised coming out this summer, and then like. You know, to July, and then, oh, it was pushed to August, and then basically the last days of August that they counted more like September. And then, of course, the PSP people got pissed off. They found that they won't be coming out till like, well, till like late September compared to <laughs> the Xbox people and stuff. So, I mean, it's like we finally have the game after the whole weekend. I mean, Paige was nice enough to to buy it for me instead of me waiting, making me wait a day or an extra couple of days. And then, like, the game wasn't like all that awesome or mind blowing spectacular. So that was a bit of a letdown. I was the one that's always walk- going ahead of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I knew where to go, sorta. Yeah. So that's basically it, guys. I don't think there's much more future news to talk about the Turtles because season two is coming pretty soon. So we don't want to say too much about it because it'll probably, you know, it'll probably might be airing by the time you're watching this episode already. And I haven't heard much new news on the Turtles movie, or the live action movie. It's still pretty much the same stuff we know so far. Yeah, it's pretty much the same old, same old. At, at least they aren't making them aliens, and Kevin Eastman's d- doing heavy involvement with it. And it looks like it's sort of modeled after the 87 series, because they, of course, have Vernon and uh, Ke- Roxy Bebop and such. And I sort of like how they explain that, like, the the aliens part came because the mutagen itself is alien in, in origin. Well, we're going to have to wait and see, but you know we're going to probably watch it and review that tri- 
a potential train wreck of a movie. Well, yes, I've been hearing, I've been listening to, like, uh, the rants about it on What the Shell, and, like, they were comment. I, I haven't seen the, um, Michael Bay's Transformers, um, thing, but... Me um, either. I heard that, I heard, like, they... The robots pee on people or something? Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay, that makes me not even care to watch the movie. It's just had too much... I don't know. So the thing is, the major thing... Have you seen any of the Transformers movies at all? I have. Okay, well, the major thing about the movie is that it does feel like it goes too much from the human point of view. The human characters and the Transformers are kind of sort of there. And I guess in the first movie, yeah. it kind of sort of works because you get to see this whole worldwide, I guess... Um, reaction to giant robots coming and fighting in our planet, but it just got too overdone in the second and third movies. We only well, they just milk the, milk the, um, the franchise, because look, the first movie got so much whatever, so might as well milk it for all it got. Yeah, <laughs> they well, keep making sequels. But we don't need all the crude humor, we don't need masturbation jokes, we don't need robots with swinging balls. What? They had a scene like that. We don't need to see dogs humping each other, and we don't need to see um, the mother getting high on marijuana brownies. Oh yeah, that. And that's that's the thing that worried me about seeing Michael's Bay, Michael Bay's name in the movie. I don't want to see toilet humor or masturbation humor or turtles arguing over who who gets the nail April first. I don't need to see that kind of jokes or humor. In the Turtles movie, and here to the kiddies watching it. So that's that's the part that worries me with having Michael Bay. I wonder how he got. It. I wonder how he got the to be able to make the movie. I don't know. Oh, he's not making the movie. He's but producing it's so scary the movie. Having his name attached to it. Yes, I I'm seriously worried about the four turtles. Um, he already put in May and Fox's um April. April. So <laughs> who knows. A lot of a lot of April leaning over scenes, I bet. Oh jeez. And they better not make it like a love story between Vernon and April, because Vernon never liked them and liked her in the cartoon or something, you know? Yeah, you know, she he, was like the like, awesome adventures of Vernon and April and oh yeah, there's like green turtle guys in this too, aren't there? I think Vernon batted for the other team, actually. Because I remember in when the Archie comics were the first one, which was based off that uh, one episode where the Shredder comes back and uh, he ha doesn't have Rocksteady and Bebop or any of the uh, his foot soldiers with him. And um, there's like this one scene where in the comic where Irma is complaining about being lonely or and Vernon comes up and says, sorry Irma, I'm all, I'm booked all this week. And Irma responds by saying, Vernon, I'm lonely, not desperate. I wonder if they put Irma in the movie like that, but it was weird though. You just don't imagine them having the Channel 6 people in the Turtles movie for some reason. It's weird. But anyways, uh, uh, what? Yeah, if you want a Ninja Turtles movie, you either base it off like the Mirage comics or maybe something like a more recent version. But, um, yeah, it's just, that was, that was weird. I heard Vernon is like, what? He's gonna be in the movie? What? That's weird. And, and of course we have William F Finchner as the Shredder, so that's that's cricket, also cricket. weird. Yeah. Whitewashing sh Shredder. Yeah. Okay. I heard rumors like there was a script or a leak script or fake or whatever script saying that he was adopted or something. I'm like, why even waste time with that and having to make up an extra whatever, you know? Cricket, cricket. <laughs> I posted in the forum once. It's like the directors are like, like we gotta hire, you know, for Shredder, and it's like, well, I don't know, all their Asian actors don't want to work with Michael Bay or something, and like, let's hire a white guy. How do we explain that? I, I don't know. You're, you're, that's what you're paying. That's what I'm paying you for. Say he's adopted or some crap. I don't know. Make some shit up. Make him white. I'm it's gonna just, cry. I don't know why what they were thinking about that but it's like making a Bruce Lee movie like his life story and you know random white dudes Bruce Lee it's like you just don't do that for a character's acknowledge for that you know it's like having the Avatar the Last Airbender movie and making all the Eskimo kids white yeah although I don't I can't think off the top of my head of any good Eskimo actors when you really think about it 
Hey, they could have gotten Taylor Lautner or Asaka. Well, they got, huh, they actually got, yeah, they, whenever they did that, um, live action, when they got, they had the guy who played yep. Jasper play Sokka. Yep. So we'll have to wait and see, and we should probably do a special podcast episode just about that alone, if we all agree to see the movie at a certain time or whatever. You'll probably have to drag me to it. No, you, the morbid curiosity is going to drag you to Not it. Not really. I'll, I'll make sure I schedule my work. <laughs> no. Please I'll make be, me work a certain day at a certain be, time. Please. For you anyways. Please make me work at this time. I don't want to go see this movie. Well, I think we'll all have to suffer through it and then give our review. Okay, I'll give you like a little cut out me. Like a little cut out cardboard me. I think I put it right beside beside you in those little theater seats. Yeah, and I'll be next to like a whole bunch of other people with car- cardboard cuts with their friends that also don't want to go. <laughs> I have a little button that says random things like this is stupid, <laughs> and I have like a cut out picture of my middle finger, <laughs> and then another phrase would be like, "Is this movie over yet?" <laughs> what? We're only five minutes into this thing. Oh yes, another phrase will be mine. Or um, what? Don't eat my damn pork, uh, popcorn, Mark. That's my other phrase. Yes, I think I'm going to need to buy a bucket of popcorn and without and the popcorn. There's a lot of booze in that movie. We'll just sneak it in. We'll just sneak it in. Yeah, I'm definitely teetotal, but I, I think I might want to flick a little, um, you know, what with me. You don't need to know. <laughs> Unless I sniff the bottle. Well, it's either that or bringing a flamethrower with me under my shirt. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think this movie is really going to be anything anyone's looking forward to. I like all the people that are still no, arguing no, about, no. give the movie a chance. How can you say it's bad? You haven't even seen it yet. It's give like... Michael Bay a chance. What did he ever do? Okay, just forget about the Transformer movies, but give him a chance and watch the turtle movie. <laughs> no. That should be like a YouTube video. <laughs> With a person wearing a turtle shirt, mascara running down their face. Give Michael Bay a chance. Like, why couldn't J.J. Abrams do this movie? At least he'd do it justice. I just hate the fact that turtles don't, like, you just have to, um... You can't even see what they look like, because all we see are just dudes in black mocaps. You really have to wait until whenever they do a trailer to actually see what they look like. So, I guess this kind of wraps up our episode yeah, for this time? for today. Um, so anyways, guys, well, well you say the goodbye stuff, Venkas. Thank you for listening, and please keep in mind we do have our own email address. It's inahalfcast at gmail.com. And we also have our own website, which is www.heroesinthehalfcast.weebly.com. Until next time, I'm Van Khalifa, the Lavender Ninja. I'm Donald Fogarty, the Green Ninja. Paige, the Pink Ninja. And Mark, the Orange Ninja, reminding you to sign up here for the petition to have Garbage Man in the 2012 version. <laughs> no. <laughs> How about a petition for um, a new producer for the movie, Trail Movie? That one I'd sign. That yes! One, that one was like My first signature! Internet. See ya! Johnny!